Welcome everybody to episode two of ProShip's ParcelCast. Today I'm joined with by uh, Josh Deneen, Chief Commercial Officer of LaserShip, and I am Justin Kramer, the Head of Sales and Co-Founder of ProShip. Today we're gonna be talking about the evolution of regional carriers. And so without any further ado, let me go ahead and bring my guest in with a question. So Josh, how, how do regionals uh, in North America get started? You know, the, the evolution of, of the regional carriers has been interesting. You know, if I flash back, let's say seven to eight years ago, you know, we were at conferences trying to bring awareness to who companies like Lasership were, what their capabilities were. And, you know, now, you know, people will come up to us at the, at the conference and, you know, say, what do you guys do? Right. And, and now it, it, the landscape has shifted where there's, you know, entire tracks at conferences about regional carriers, why you should use them, what are their, what are they, you know, best leveraged for, or pavilions inside of some of the uh, conferences dedicated to housing the regional carriers and, and retailers and e-commerce uh, shippers are coming to our booth and saying, you know, we've been looking for you or we'd like to talk about how you guys can partner with us. So I think that's just sort of an interesting take is that the, you know, it was originally, you know, who are you guys and what do you do to now, you know, we're looking to diversify our carrier mix and execute a multi-carrier strategy. And we think you guys are going to be a good fit for us. Right. Or we'd like to explore that. Um, in terms of like getting started, you know, we, we, we ended up getting started by being able to, create a network between our facilities and, and, you know, and offer that back to the e-commerce shippers. So I think, you know, that that's generally where folks would want to get started is understanding what's your scope, what's your regional capability, and then how can you turn that into a value add for a particular region or, or something that, that could be leveraged by an e-commerce shipper. And, and just so our listeners know, how big of an area does, does LaserShip currently service? We are currently in 20 states, including the District of Columbia, pretty much along the eastern seaboard, and then expanding west through Indiana. Yeah, and that, that uh, uh, have you always been that footprint, or did you start with a smaller footprint? As a regional carrier, we were um, up and down the eastern seaboard, you know, mm -hmm. and then we, we expanded west through organic uh, expansion and some small acquisitions. There we go. Okay, excellent. Yeah, because I, I do remember um, uh, 20 years ago when when Parcel Forum first started and things of that nature, there were barely any regionals at all. It was uh, you know selling multi-carrier shipping software was interesting because well there was only just a handful of carriers, and when DHL came in and bought out Airborne, that really started to reduce the number of carriers, and there was concern uh, for some in the industry that there wasn't going to be enough competition. I don't think we have that problem right now though. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a fair statement. I used to actually work at Airborne right out of, after school, um, and I remember my first time at at Parcel Forum. We weren't exhibiting. I was just walking the halls, trying to understand, you know, what was the landscape there. And the only carriers, to your point, were at that time DHL, UPS, FedEx, and the USPS. I'm not even sure. I mean, obviously there would have been maybe some line haul carriers or something like that. But in terms of Parcel. You know there, that that was it. That was the game, and, and and I think ultimately that's what enabled Lasership to really have an opportunity to come onto the scene was when when DHL made the decision to exit the domestic market, and it left a hole. I mean, it left a gap, right? And and that's ultimately where I believe, and, and it was all the the talk in the sort of sort of mid 2000 teens was the duopoly. Right. And so DHL formed the duopoly by taking the only competition there was out of the game. And it really left a void. And so a company like Lasership or maybe, you know, a similar looking company on the West Coast that many of the listeners might be familiar with on track that left an opportunity for us to come in and pick up some of the, the pieces that were left in that void and, and bring something to the market that is now a, what I believe a permanent layer of the parcel network. Well, and, and let's talk about the differences. So, so we, we just did a great job of talking about the the duopoly that existed in the in the late uh, uh, 
single digit two thousands. Um, but as as LaserShip came forward, as others in the industry started to come forward, I think one of the first things that there was is, is there was a lot of differences between the services that you could offer versus the service that the duopoly offered. Yeah, I think that th absolutely that's that's a very good uh, statement, and I think that's where the market was 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 looking for. They were looking for opportunities. How can we increase the speed to guest? How can we have more flexibility than UPS or FedEx or maybe the postal hybrid uh, services or services are offering us? Right? What, what can we do that's going to be differential? How are we competing at, with Amazon? Is Amazon Prime, you know, begin to really take steam? How, you know, and, and if they're selling the same product, well, Amazon's going to get it there free and in two days. You getting it there for $7.99 in five days isn't going to ultimately make it happen, right? And so when the marketing teams as these retailers, and this is this is how they were talking with us, we're talking to the transportation team, like, well, we can't do that anymore. We need to market two-day delivery. And it forced the sort of the transportation and supply chain and logistics divisions of these retailers to go to the market and find a different alternative. And ultimately that's what enabled us uh, and some other regionals to to be able to really make it make a difference. Well, and, and Josh, one of the things I, I've, I've also noticed for any carrier, uh, especially when when our customers are looking to find the the lowest cost, fastest route out there, because well, let's face it, that's what they're looking for. They want to least impact their logistics budget while while maintaining an experience with the customers that they've already sold them. Um, how much do you would you say network plays into that? Because it's very clear that you would have a very different network uh, than 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 the big two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things that enables us to scale. And it's been, you know, one of the things that's enabled us even if you think back over the last six months during the pandemic of LaserShip. And I've heard very sort of similar comments for other regionals was that the performance has been pretty strong during through throughout the you know, the stay at home executive orders and and sort of folks being at home. You know, LaserShip developed the network specifically for residential e-commerce deliveries. Unlike the FedEx and UPS, the duopoly, um, and what they do is what they do better than anybody else. They're, you know, really one of the only two companies that you can get anything delivered anywhere in the, the US or typically in the world, right? We're not recreating that. And even in the states that we service, we also don't service every single zip code. So we've not designed a network to do that. And we haven't designed the network to handle B2B commercial multiple packages per stop delivery. So when the pandemic happened and everybody went home, you know, having an, a network that was solely designed for residential e-commerce deliveries, it enabled us to just achieve scale. That, and, and also it's, it's right where everybody needed to be, right? Because if everybody went home, that's where your sweet spot was. How do you, uh, is there anything specific that you do that, that you know, if I were, if I were a large retailer, um, uh, is there anything specific that LaserShip does that makes it really residential focused rather than, um, you know, another regional or uh, the big two? Well, you know, the, the, the big two, right? develop the network for B2B delivery, for the, the things going to offices and the payroll and the office supplies and everything that's going into one high rise, they could they could have a brown truck parked outside all day. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know that and then e-commerce, right, sort of just happened. Yes, there was some catalog delivery, but the catalog stuff mostly went with USPS, right? E-commerce happened and they ended up bolting it on to their existing networks. It's kind of what uh, Airborne Express did when they launched a, a ground service. They basically launched a ground service so that the sales reps could compete with FedEx and UPS's air and ground multiple uh, service offering, but they flew most of the packages. I mean, destroyed profitability because they didn't have a ground network, right? So it's UPS and FedEx did very something very similar uh, the way that I, I look at it. It was, well, we can we have these trucks and we've got, we go and we cover every, part of the country, we can deliver to these houses too. But it's a different cost structure, it's a different makeup, it's a different time um, commitment for the deliveries. And it, you know, they're getting it done, obviously. Everybody gets packages delivered from FedEx and UPS. But 
uh, you know, we, we've been fortunate to design where we are not looking uh, to design the economics and the network and uh, the route structures and, and the way that our density it applies to, to need commercial deliveries. In fact, it's, it's not something that we actually pursue. Yeah, so, so it's a good way of saying that again, that let's face it, UPS and FedEx, they're, they're tens of years old. Um, and you guys have, were able to form yourselves during that, that change, during that e-commerce change that was brought about by the technology advancements in the 90s. Um, and you guys have just, it feels like you guys have just been well positioned to take advantage of that hole in the market, especially east of the Mississippi. That's a, a great way to put it, Justin. Excellent. Well, speaking of change, obviously um, uh, life is very different than it was uh, uh, for many of us uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And life continues to change at a greater pace right now. Um, we know that consumers' behaviors are, are changing, but how would how has leadership seen uh, consumers' behaviors changing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because it's looking at it, you know, I guess, are, are you more asking through the lens of pandemic related or just the, the recent trends? Both, both. Yeah. Look, we continue, you know, we, we, we do a survey every year with over a thousand consumers where we're looking to understand what are the shopping behaviors, what are the shipping preferences that, that the consumers are looking for. And we continue to see, right, the, what I call the F words for, for shipping. It's free and fast, right? Those, those are the, the, the big macros and those don't change. Free always, you know, is a constant now. And everybody typically has some type of free shipping, right? Whether it's a subscription like Prime or like Walmart Plus now that they offer, or, you know, if you spend $35, the, right, the shipping is free. It's, it's kind of a requirement. It's a, it's a must have uh, in, the, in the market. But what we've continued to see year over year is speed gaining prominence in the value chain, right? So we see folks really looking for, okay, is it free? And then when am I going to get it? So if it's not a subscription service, like uh, something that comes every single month and you're kind of just counting on it or you don't need it, but if, if you, you know, again, a little bit sh uh, shaped by Amazon being able to shape some of the behaviors, people are looking for it and they have a, an expectation that it's going to be there fast, right? Whether that's today, tomorrow, two to three days, that is becoming the, the new norm. And what we see is really interesting is that even the younger generation, so millennials and Gen Z specifically, you know, over 30% over of them have paid and are willing to pay for an exp expedited delivery option, which is quite a contrast from baby boomers and a lot of Gen Xers that kind of came, a, came a, about during the, you know, they were adults and already had a wallet share when, when e-commerce came about and, and then it was very free, shipping became, became the norm. These, these are the generations that grew up with getting e-commerce delivery, shopping online, and I want it now, and they're gaining also wallet share. So, you know, the workforce is gonna be made up like 75% of Gen X, or sorry, um, Gen Z and millennials in the next five years, they're gonna be commanding a greater share of the wallet. What yeah. also I was like to say that they, they never grew up with the commercials that said, wait six for eight weeks for delivery. And that was acceptable. <laughs> that was the norm. In three installments of 1999 plus shipping and handling, right? There you go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a good point. And and so they don't know any better. It's just what it is. And then what we really saw, which was an interesting shift during the pandemic, was the baby boomers. And so what we what we saw was when the stores closed. And what may have been part of a weekly getting out of the house for maybe, you know, I am sort of doing a general theme here of, of a mm -hmm. retired couple in Florida. I'm just being, uh, you know, super prescriptive. Uh, you know, get out of the house and go to the store. They didn't have that option anymore. So if they needed something, obviously they could go to the grocery store, but you, you know, they went, they started shopping online. The convenience factor and the awareness of, multiple retailers or different sites and places they could go and different types of products, you can't turn that off, right? Once you're aware that it exists and there's a better option and a way to get that product, right? All of them or the majority of them commented that they would continue shopping online post pandemic. And I think when you think about the offline to online 
acceleration that took place, you know, it's, it's never going to go back. I mean, of course, I think you, Justin, and I, we both want uh, the world to go back to as much normal as we can as fast as possible, whether that's a vaccine or anything else, you know, would prefer that. But the, the behaviors of shopping online and the convenience and availability of product and different brands, you know, it's just never going to go back to, to the way it was. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and and for our listeners who might be listening in the future, this is being recorded in in uh, uh, November of, of 2020. So we are well into the pandemic at this point in time. Hopefully, if you're listening to this in the future, vaccines will have been out, things will have changed. But let's talk about that. So, since we've seen this year such dramatic changes, um, uh, let's, let's move to the second half of that question, which is, well, how has LaserShip seen a change specifically during the pandemic? And I'm assuming at some point in time here, we're going to have to talk about uh, capacity constraints because it's affecting everybody. Yeah, absolutely. The, the pandemic, I mean, most of it has been, you know, kind of across the board. And we saw really all verticals, uh, apparel and fashion and, and health and beauty, uh, perishables, right? Uh, everything increased. And, and obviously, you know, laser ship and and the national carriers and the regionals, we were the only way that folks were getting the product. And it was, it was really kind of an interesting social experiment to be a part of where, you know, it was, we were, we were the essential workers. Everybody was very scared in, in March and April, right? And, and when we were the folks out there delivering, there's such great uh, pictures that we would get going around the, the company of signs left for drivers, tips left for drivers, food left for drivers, Thank you for delivering this stuff. Help yourself. It was it was really kind of a, a you know interesting thing to sort of watch unfold. And you know, again, I, I just I really see that that sticking as um, as as we continue. And, and and we've seen as well many of the stores that retailers had to close because of executive orders. They're not opening them all again. So many of those were permanent closures, and obviously, I, you know, one would assume that that was a underperforming store or, or what have you. But right, the online sales channel was the option for the retailers. They've seen, you know, a great acceleration, customer stickiness and loyalty from what we're seeing and and, and is increasing. And so I think that's going to be the avenue that the retailers are focusing. Yeah, I, I do have to say we've we've seen a lot of a lot of customers convert stores to dark stores. Um, yeah. allows them to, to reclassify personnel as warehouse workers, essential workers, things of that nature. Um, but the other thing we've seen uh, is a huge demand for services like yours, uh, actually a rush to try to get these things in place uh, because you offer additional capacity uh, with the uh, with all indications pretty much stating that that we've seen basically a 10 year advance in e-commerce volumes. What we'd expect to see in, in the uh, in 2030 are here today, um, and you're right. I don't think even even post pandemic that all of that is going to roll back. Now that so many people have gotten past that barrier to entry, now that the boomers and and uh, some of the uh, uh, more resistant uh, uh, Gen Xs have figured out how to order things online, many of them aren't going to go back for everything. They'll go back for some, but uh, a lot of this peak capacity that we're seeing now is going to be closer to the new norm as we continue throughout the 2020s. Uh, so, so Josh, talk to me a little bit about, um, I'm assuming right now, uh, it being November, I, I'm assuming that, that now is too late for a retailer, for a, a, a direct-to-consumer manufacturer to try to onboard new capacity. Would that be correct? Absolutely. And Justin, it's so interesting, even yesterday, you know, we're getting pinged by you know, not a small uh, brand asking, hey, we need capacity for this month and next month. And that's, you know, wow. I don't know what you guys have been doing for the last few months, but I mean, that, that train has long since left the station. You know, that mm -hmm. we, we were able to help uh, several brands that we had really been in very deep conversations with over the recent periods. And I'll call that, you know, say, zero to 18 months type time frame we were able to onboard some of them the year before coming into our code freeze for for the peak holiday season uh but you know if they weren't if they weren't kicking those conversations up you know amid the you know beginning of the pandemic then it was ultimately 
quite frankly, too late. Everything was scaling quickly. Every customer's volumes were double or more. And, you know, the, the networks just dried up very quickly. I mean, we, we had to stop sort of uh, 2020 conversations in July, which was much earlier than any other year we've ever had to do that. And, and then the conversations shifted quickly to, we get it. Uh, we can't solve your problem in 2020, but you know the the problem isn't going away, right? It's not. It, this isn't over on the, on December 26th. And to your point, it, it 10 years or five years acceleration that's taken place, right? The 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 networks are not ready to handle all of that today. And I, I'd be interested, really going to be interested to watch what happens with. Uh, the USPS this this peak holiday season. There's there's lots of speculation out there around it, even from what's taking place today. And you know the conversations then shifted to, uh, well, we need to keep talking if you're interested in us solving that problem in 2021. We've, we're already in the process of integration for a very large, um, not U.S. based uh, sports retailer, and you know they were ready to start on January 1st. And we mm -hmm. said, well, that's, that is a holiday here, but you know, hey, look, the second or the third, we're, we're ready to go and, and we'll be happy to, to help after we were, you know, had to tell them we were, we were unable to, to really help them this peak. And, and we're seeing a lot of acceleration on that front. Retailers are, you know, quickly shifted to figuring out, well, what am I going to do? You know, kind of solidified those plans that the, those plans are pretty much in place here as November 4th. But um, and then shifting back with, okay, well, now I really need to solve the problem because I don't want to be in the same position next September or October, and I can't do it again. And, and what is what is a good lead time? So if I'm if I'm a logistics manager or, or VP of logistics or something like that, and I, I I know when my peaks are, I know if it's if it's Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, beginning of spring, something of that nature, maybe back to school what lead time should I really be looking for to ensure that I've, I've got my extra capacity well onboarded, um, I've got my, um, uh, my contracts in place, uh, and also I, I've got my tech stack prepared for that. Do you guys have a, a rule of thumb that, that you'd recommend that uh, customers use? So it's a great question, Justin. And, and we, we do press typically to say, look, you need to move as fast as you can and waiting is gonna cause problems. There's going to be a delay, whether it's something inside your four walls or, right, depending on, you know, hey, if they're using ProShip, it might be very smooth uh, integration to get the, the carrier added to the TMS, uh, but maybe they need some IT resources and they got to juggle whatever their tech roadmap is or tying into a WMS. Like those, those are where the integration delays typically happen. And we say, look, your integration should be somewhere between 30 and 90 days. If it gets longer than that, something happened in terms of you getting resources allocated uh, or or some other sort of variable that was unknown, uh, like, a, like a facility that wasn't finished to build out or construction. But, uh, you know, just typically I'd say 30 to 90, but to your point, you know, having the right uh, tech stack and, you know, tech solution to add carriers, I mean, really enables everything. And that's where we'll, we'll end up seeing the delay. We'll make a we'll go into an execute agreement like, well, we haven't selected our TMS. I'm like, well, you really should focus on getting that done so that you can actually leverage the services you, you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of warehouses do some manual workarounds and things of that nature. It's always better when it's in the tech stack, but it's nice to know the actual physical timeline uh, to make sure that trailer is gonna start, uh, uh, trucks are gonna start showing up and pulling my packages. So I think that's really, really important. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, um, I've been seeing, one of the indications I've been seeing, and I just want to see if you guys have got any opinion on this, it doesn't feel like there's going to be a very large post peak as we're used to. I mean, most customers, uh, mo most retailers that I'm used to, most manufacturers I'm used to, um, by the time they get to the end of January, they can breathe again. Things have gone down maybe to 10% of what they were in December. Given the, that uh, at this point in time, you know, early November, we're not seeing a vaccine yet. We're not seeing a full suite of, of treatments uh, uh, for the current pandemic. Are, are you guys also expecting that, that though there's going to be an increase in throughput during the uh, November, December timeframe, that there's not going to be as much of a decrease 
as we normally see uh, in January and February? Yeah, so great question again. And I think I think that's accurate, right? The, the networks are so constrained now. It's gonna be really interesting to see how these retailers manage the marketing that, you know, gets the sales that they need done in, in Q4 here and, and and at the holiday time frame and you know ultimately what enables the the that trend to keep going we, we see a lot of folks doing more sales in January than they have or, or telling us that they're going to have sales in January than they have in the past and mm -hmm. typically we get gift card hangover as we kind of call it where people give gift cards for Christmas and they then they go and spend them on the retailers and then we get to do the the deliveries and I think that we're going to continue to see that, right? Especially as maybe some family members aren't going to be traveling, right? We may see some different gifts being shipped across the country or gift cards being sent electronically so that somebody can make the purchase that they'd like because they're not going to be together. And that probably will make up for what I think we'll probably see a little bit of a lull in is we typically get right in the health and beauty verticals, right? People decide New Year's resolution, I'm going to the gym, I'm going to lose weight. So they're ordering the protein powders and the post or the pre-workouts and the post-workout supplements, et cetera. You know, the gyms are not as open as people are not going to the level that they, they normally have. So I'm, I, I think we're going to see some softness in that vertical, at least yeah. from at least from the customers that we're partnering with. So uh, but I think to your point, Justin, it'll likely be more than made up with, you know, not the, not a normal peak hangover where you do have a, a drop out of the volume. I think it's going to, it's not going to be the same, but, and for, you know, just a carrier like LaserShip, we have so many new retailers begging to start in January that, you know, we'll probably sort of just keep the line going. Well, if, if volume doesn't go down, uh, my primary point on this is volume does not go down as it normally would do throughout the first quarter. That means that companies have to be prepared to modify their tech stacks to modify their operations in order to, to leverage uh, the, 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 the new carriers that they wanna use, new capacity that they wanna use. They have to be prepared to do that under load. And that's gonna be different than it's been any year in the past, except for maybe companies that, that are seeing a rapid growth curve. Um, so so uh, CIOs, uh, VPs of logistics, um, uh, the, the project management teams, they're going to have to be prepared, in my opinion, to work more in a startup mode to be able to, to modify their tech stack and modify their operations under load. So just a, a, an interesting thing to think about because it's always difficult to do things under load. Um, uh, and remember, in this case, we're not just talking about that tech stack, but we're talking about the physical operation changes that need to happen as well. You know, do you have enough doors to put all those trailers? Do yeah. you have, or do you have to, uh, 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 shuffle trailers around before they can be, get picked up. All these other things that you might have to think of. So, just uh, it's just been a very, very interesting set of thought questions that uh, our team has been going through as part of this uh, pandemic because of what we saw in Q2 of, of 2020. Great points. All right. So, Josh, at the end of here, we want to make sure that, that we give you an opportunity to. Uh, uh, any advice you've got for for customers looking for for a, a regional uh, customers looking for um, to provide a better uh, residential delivery process, anything like that? Now is your time to go ahead and spread it out to our audience. Yeah, I appreciate it, Justin. It's been a great conversation with you today. I would encourage folks to have a bias for action earlier. That we, we are we are going to have a very similar 2021 in terms of the parcel network capacity. It, we're gonna have the same capacity constraints in Q3 and everyone's gonna be staring down the same barrel of Q4 next year. So I would, I would encourage folks to do your diligence and do that during peak, right? You know, that, that's a great time to be doing integrations where you're on the test servers and getting your TMS and your tech stack ready. We, we're doing testing, you can see sample labels. Get all that done while you're not touching your system. You're you're getting your Q4 holiday volume out, and be 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 an early adopter because again, I have a feeling that mid mid to late summer next year, we are going to be staring down again the same barrel of the same gun. Excellent, excellent. All right, so um, thank you all for attending today, Josh. Thank you as well. 
Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, Lasership has recently published a white paper on how retailers can stay ahead of their consumer expectations after COVID-19. You can find it on their website under resources at www.lasership.com. Thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions, just a reminder for you that you can reach ProShip at sales at proshipinc.com or 800-353-7774 and Lasership at 703-761-9030. We hope you can join us next month when on the ProShip Parcel Cast as we dive into the world of Canadian parcel shipping with Pure Later. Again, Josh Deneen, thank you very much. Josh Deneen is the Chief Commercial Officer of Lasership. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.